Hello, my name is Jeremy Gilliland. I'm from the University of Utah. I'm here to discuss cup positioning and anatomic restoration using fluoroscopy in the direct anterior total hip arthroplasty, and more specifically, how to use the orthogrid drone device for fluoroscopic navigation. These are my disclosures. Of note, I do have a pertinent disclosure in that I'm a shareholder and a paid consultant for orthogrid. I also receive institutional research support from Zimmer Biomet. This is a brief outline of what we'll be going over today. It is well known that ideal acetabular and femoral component positioning improves total hip arthroplasty outcomes. As seen in the image on the bottom right hand side of this slide from the 2011 Callanan study, there is still significant room for improvement in our accuracy of component positioning and as demand increases we will need to make sure that we have simple, efficient, reproducible, and cost-effective methods to reliably improve our positioning of total hip components. The original safe zone of 40 plus or minus 10 degrees of abduction and 15 plus or minus 10 degrees of antiversion described by Lewinick in 1978 has held up as the gold standard to help prevent not only dislocation but also improve outcomes for all of the other reasons listed here. Several studies have questioned the Lewinick safe zone as it may not be perfect for all patients and that being within this zone does not necessarily mandate stability. However, currently the acetabular component position of 40 degrees of abduction and 15 degrees of aneurysm still holds up as a target for our component positioning. Limb length discrepancy after total hip arthroplasty has been associated with a number of postoperative issues as listed here. There's no general consensus on the amount of acceptable discrepancy, but generally, we accept a gold standard restoration goal of within 10 millimeters from the contralateral side as this is a conservative goal often used in the literature. Femoral offset restoration has been shown to be important to improve gait and decrease wear. Hip offset is potentially a better gauge of abductor lever arm restoration as this accounts for the medialization of the acetabular component often seen with total hip arthroplasty. No real consensus exists as to the ideal amount of allowable hip offset discrepancy, and we've generally used a target of within 10 millimeters or 1 centimeter of the contralateral side as a goal for the amount of discrepancy for hip offset restoration. Various component positioning aids exist in total hip arthroplasty for both the posterior and anterior approaches. In this talk, we'll be discussing the use of fluoroscopy and the orthogrid drone device as our component positioning aid. Before we get started, it's important to go over the differences between fluoroscopy and plane radiography. In a fluoroscopic unit, the input phosphor absorbs the X-ray photons and converts them into optical photons, a phenomenon called luminescence. These optical photons are converted to photoelectrons at the photocathode, and these electrons are then accelerated across the image intensifier and are collected at the output phosphor. This schematic, seen in the upper right-hand side of the screen, is a diagram of a fluoroscopic image intensifier. Some things to note are that one, the input phosphor is curved, not flat, while the output phosphor is flat. Two, there's a conversion of the X-ray photons into electrons that are accelerated across the image intensifier. Neither of these things are present in flat plate radiography, and it's because of these two distinct differences that distortion exists in fluorography and not plane radiography. The distortion that occurs from the acceleration of electrons across the image intensifier is influenced by electromagnetic interferences, and these come from a variety of sources in or around the operating theater. Modern C-arm fluoroscopic units have EMF shielding, but as I will show you in several upcoming images, this shielding does not eliminate distortion completely. This is a quote out of a computer science journal discussing fluoroscopic distortion. And I think that these authors hit the nail on the head in this highlighted section as they alluded to the fact that if using fluoroscopy for surgical navigation, the images must be corrected for distortion. There are really two main types of distortion seen with fluoroscopy, pincushion and S-type distortion. The pincushion distortion occurs due to the curved surface of the input phosphor being converted to a flat surface at the output phosphor. S-type distortion occurs due to electromagnetic disturbances. This image is one in which we put a magnet in the field and you can see the distortion that it caused to the otherwise straight grid. The main point is that these distortions do exist 
and you probably would never know it if you did not have a grid within the field such as that pictured in these images. The question is, does distortion really exist in our total hip imaging, and does it really impact our results? This is a case of mine in which I use the orthogrid device to navigate my total hip. At the end of the case, we removed the orthogrid device, redraped the C-arm, and obtained this fluoroscopic image. At first glance, you would not notice any significant distortion to this image. If I draw a transitional line on the computer monitor, as seen here, it would seem that I'm short on the operative side by a significant amount, and that I need to lengthen my operative side. However, this is my intraoperative fluoro shot with the orthogrid in place, and we can see that significant distortion does exist, and that based on the grid lines, which are also distorted along with the patient's anatomy, my limb lengths are correct. Most importantly, when looking at my postoperative plane radiographic image, my limb length is correct. Here's another case of distortion in which a transitional line drawn on the monitor of the C-arm would tell you that you're long on the operative side. However, the orthogrid would tell you that the limb length is correct. As seen in this postoperative image, the limb length is correct just as the orthogrid told us. Here's yet another case of distortion in which a transitional line drawn on the monitor of the C-arm would tell you that you're short on the operative side. However, the orthogrid would tell you the limb length is correct. Again, as seen in this postoperative image, the limb length is correct just as the orthogrid told us. Now we will discuss preoperative planning. It is important to get a standing AP pelvis x-ray preoperatively as this gives us insight into the patient's native standing pelvic tilt. I also use a templating ball which my radiology techs try to position at the level of the femur so that this better represents the size of the patient at the level of the hip. I also obtain a groin lateral film to better understand femoral antiversion and any acetabular bone loss. I think preoperative templating is imperative for a successful result. I use my template to tell me several things. First, I look at the depth of my cup placement based on patient offset and available stem configurations. I use the template to look at the amount of reaming medial and superior that my template predicts, and this tells me how much medialization is necessary prior to reaming up. If the reaming looks to be symmetric on the template, then I ream at about 45 degrees from the start. I next use the template to plan the length of my neck cut. I then draw on my templating image the trans teardrop line to use as a reference of the patient's standing pelvic tilt, or what we like to call pelvic pitch. I will show you how to use this reference in a bit. I also use the preoperative standing AP pelvis image to look at my various limb length reference lines, that is the trans teardrop line, bottom of the operator foramina, or transitional line, to see which is reliable so that intraoperatively I'm using the correct reference. Of note, the trans teardrop line has been shown to be the most reproducible landmark in several studies. Here we can see that in this patient there's a large enthesophyte along the inferior margin of the right ischial tuberosity. This would throw off the transitional line and I would therefore avoid using this as a reference line for limb length in this case. Finally, preoperative templating gives you a peace of mind prior to the case, which in simple cases such as this may not be all that necessary but in more complicated cases such as this and this, templating helps you to get a predictable outcome every time. So, now we need to talk about how to actually use the orthogrid drone device intraoperatively. First, the drone device needs to be slid onto the image intensifier. It is then clamped into place using the quick release lever. The C-arm is then draped in standard fashion as shown here. This can all be easily done by your C-arm tech or circulating nurse during your standard case setup. Once you're ready to take your first image, you must first set up the image so that you recreate the patient's standing AP pelvis image and can then use this image to navigate placement of the acetabular component and judge limb length and hip offset restoration. Adjustment of the image involves four simple steps as seen here. Briefly, this involves first adjusting the tilt and rainbow of the C-arm to recreate the standing AP pelvis, followed by adjusting the rotation and translation of the orthogrid using the drone device to line the grid up with the pelvic image. To set up the image to match the standing pelvic tilt or pelvic pitch, we need to first understand how to measure the pelvic pitch from the preoperative 
AP pelvis image. Here we see some lateral drawings of three different standing pelvic pitches. The image on the left is a relatively normal pelvic pitch in which the trans teardrop line, shown in blue, lines up with the top of the pubic symphysis, shown as a purple dot. The image in the middle is more of an outlet type pelvic pitch in which the top of the pubic symphysis is above the trans teardrop line and the image on the right is more of an inlet type pelvic pitch in which the top of the pubic symphysis is below the trans teardrop line. In this patient, we can see that the trans teardrop line falls below the top of the symphysis and this is what we will first try to recreate using the tilt of the C-arm. Here you can see that the grid lines can be used to show restoration of this patient's standing pelvic pitch by adjustment of the tilt of the C-arm. In essence, we're using the grid lines like an inclinometer on an airplane to help adjust the tilt of the C-arm to recreate the patient's standing anatomy. Next, we must make sure that the pelvic rotation is parallel with the face of the C-arm. We adjust the pelvic rotation using the rainbow on the C-arm. The goal of this adjustment is to get the posterior elements of the pelvic ring to line up with the anterior elements. In other words, we want to get the center of the sacrum to line up with the pubic symphysis. A secondary check is to look at the obturator foramina and make sure that they look symmetric as shown in the image on the right. Once we've recreated our standing AP pelvis image via tilt and rainbow of the C-arm, we must then rotate and translate the orthogrid to give us an image that can now be successfully used for navigation. Now that we have a good fluoroscopic image, we can begin positioning our components. So first, let's talk about cup positioning. I don't use fluoro to ream, so usually the first fluoro image that I obtain looks something like this, in that I tap the cup down into the reamed acetabulum in approximately the correct position, and then I bring in fluoro. From there, I again make sure that I have a good image in that my pelvic pitch is correct and my pelvic rotation looks good. I then make sure that the acetabulum is roughly in the center of the fluoro image in terms of north-south. When this is the case, one of the upper lines from the series of lines on the bottom of the grid will overlie the teardrops as shown here. You can adjust the rotation and translation of the grid for fine adjustments to get the grid lines to line up with the teardrops and the center of the grid on the symphysis. Once you have this image, you can then use the 45 and 35 degree lines as guides to component positioning. If you're using a straight impaction handle as shown here, you can compare the impaction handle to the 45 degree impactor line as a secondary check. Once the cup is down, you can then translate the C-arm over the cup itself so that the 35 and 45 degree lines are flanking the cup. You can then look at the edge of your acetabular component and make sure that this is slightly steeper than the 35 degree line and slightly flatter than the 45 degree line as shown here. As a warning, you're not simply looking to have the edge of your cup sit between the 35 and 45 degree lines. It's not enough to simply have the cup sitting between these two lines, but rather these lines are used as angular references. For instance, in this image we have a cup that is too steep with probably 50 to 55 degrees of abduction while the edge of the cup is physically sitting between the 35 and 45 degree lines. If we think of these lines as angular references and not goal posts, then we can see that this cup edge is steeper than both the 35 and 45 degree lines and is therefore too abducted. In this case, we have a cup that is too flat with probably 20 to 25 degrees of abduction while the edge of the cup is physically sitting between the 35 and 45 degree lines. If we again think of these lines as angular references rather than goalposts, we can see that this cup edge is flatter than both the 35 and 45 degree lines and is therefore too flat. Here we have a cup that is just right and we can see that this cup edge is steeper than the 35 degree line and flatter than the 45 degree line and is therefore approximately 40 degrees abducted. For limb length and hip offset judgment, I follow a similar algorithm as cup placement. I first make sure that our image is okay in terms of pelvic pitch and pelvic rotation. I then center the pelvis in the field, but instead of placing the acetabulum centered in the field in terms of north-south as we did with the cup, I make sure that the lesser trochanters are roughly in the center of the fluoro image in terms of north-south and that both lessers can be seen in the field. 
When this is the case, the uppermost darker trans teardrop lines will overlie the teardrops as shown here. You can then adjust the rotation of the orthogrid to line up with the teardrops as it has been in this image. Of note, if you're having difficulty seeing both lesser trochanters in one image, you can lower the height of the C-arm or raise the operative table to decrease the magnification of the anatomy and get both lessers on one image. Next, you translate the grid so that the central vertical line is centered over the symphysis. I then double check my pelvic rotation one last time by comparing the distances from these vertical dark lines on the grid to the edges of the ischia to make sure that they are roughly the same side to side. I then make sure that the femoral abduction is approximately the same on both sides prior to comparing limb lengths or offset. In order to compare limb lengths, you then simply compare where the two lesser trochanters intersect the horizontal grid lines. Hip offset is then judged in similar fashion by comparing which vertical line intersects with the apex of each lesser trochanter. Of note, the vertical lines are numbered to make side-to-side -side comparison easier. If you remember that in most patients the grid boxes are about 8 mm by 8 mm, then you can judge the amount of limb length and hip offset differences using this scale and adjust the neck length of your head or the offset of your stem as needed to restore the patient's anatomy as closely as possible. In the end, this yields a total hip with a post-op standing x-ray such as this with a cup in ideal position and excellent restoration of both hip offset and limb length. We studied our experience using an earlier generation table-based grid design and published this work in the Journal of Arthroplasty in 2012. In this paper, we compared 39 direct anterior total hips done using fluoroscopy and a table-based grid to 60 direct anterior total hips done using fluoroscopy alone. As you can see here, the hips done with the orthogrid were far superior in terms of cup abduction, limb length, and hip offset restoration and being within all three of these goals. The table-based grid was much less adjustable than the current fluoroscopic-based orthogrid drone device, which we feel is more accurate. We are currently in the process of evaluating our outcomes with the new fluoro-based orthogrid device.